Hello and welcome to our special IVD Ready webinar for manufacturers. The scope of the webinar is to give the summary about the impact of IVDR on manufacturers of products for in vitro diagnostics and also to show you how Platonic's platform for automated regulatory documentation can create a win-win situation for both manufacturers and laboratories. My name is Elena Gromberg. I am a head of customer success team focusing on manufacturers at Platomics, and I will be guiding you through the agenda of our webinar today. We have prepared a very interesting program for you today, and I'm also glad to see that we have many attendees from different countries, even from different continents, including the leading IVD manufacturers and biggest European laboratories. Feel free to write your questions in the chat of our webinar. We will um, uh, give feedback to all questions that we collected, even if there will be not enough time to answer them live during the webinar. I also want to inform you upfront that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website at the beginning of next week. So feel free to sh share the link with all your lucky colleagues that are currently on vacation. <laughs> um, and with this, I want to move directly to our agenda. We have invited outstanding four speakers with very diverse backgrounds and expertise. Uh, our first speaker, Tom Miller, a founder of Great Bird Ventures and uh, a former CEO of Siemens Healthcare, will present macro trends in medical diagnostics and implications for industry. The next speaker, Andres Eckelt, a managing director of the consulting company IVDR Consulting, will talk about IVDR for manufacturers. Um, Professor Elizabeth McIntyre will tell us about the insights from the laboratories. She is a president-elect and a board member of the um, um, Medical Alliance Biomedical Alliance in Europe, and she will tell us about uh, how IVDR challenges the in-house testing. And finally, our partner and our early adopter, Medix Bio uh, Biochemica and Simone Marx, will tell us about how IVDR affected customers of the Medix and will share their insights. Finally, I am presenting you the platform for automated regulatory uh, documentation created by Platomics, and I also want to emphasize that this webinar is a part of IVD Ready program, and I will tell you some information about this program, the roadmap, the main benefits and milestones of this program as in the last part of the webinar. And with this, let's begin, and I'm very glad to welcome our first speaker, Tom. Please, you're very welcome. Thank you, Elena. Let me see if I can get through the first hurdle, which is always sharing my screen. If you can see this, then I was um, successful with yes. the first step. Yes, we can see. Perfect. So I'm very honored to be asked to present this overview, and I hope I don't insult anyone's intelligence with it, because I'm going to say some things that I think are quite obvious to many of you. Um, my comments are based upon a 40-year career in diagnostics, running large companies and small and founding my own in medical imaging, pathology, as well as in vitro diagnostics. Currently, Greybird Ventures, the company I founded, invests in, only in diagnostics, and we maintain a di database of 1,900 diagnostic companies, most of which are early stage. That also helps to inform my thoughts. But... I'm going to start with saying something every single person on this call probably knows, that diagnostics can be ultimately reduced to a receiver operating characteristic to define the performance of the test. It tells you about sensitivity, specificity, and if you want a single number, you look at the area under this curve and you say whether the test is good or not. However, as most of you veterans also know, this is also insufficient. A test ultimately needs to also be characterized by the indications for use and the instance of disease and the consequences of use. And in fact, 
we can ask ourselves a trick question. Um, if you have a diagnostic test that has 100% sensitivity and 95% specificity, is this a good test? Well, most people would be overjoyed with this performance, but it depends on the two parameters I just mentioned. And in fact, if you test a million people for this, for a disease, and one in a thousand have it, you would, in reality, expect that 1,000 persons test positive. But with this performance, you'll get 50,000, meaning that you'll have to treat 50 people in order to cure one. Now, if the treatment is an aspirin, no problem. If the treatment is, however, an invasive therapy or medication, which has great counterindications for use, this could be indeed problematic. Natural incidence is highly critical. Unfortunately, however, biological science is working against us. You see, a hundred years ago, if you showed up at a hospital and you were fainting and weak and anemic and tired, physician would say you have a disease of the blood. 80 years ago, he would say you have the leukemia or lymphoma. 60 years ago, one of five diseases, and today, that number is approaching 100. Disease by disease, we are discovering that a certain set of symptoms no longer is a single disease, but a multiplicity of subtypes. And understanding the characteristics of these subtypes enables us to treat them with targeted therapies and improve survival. What this means, of course, is that when I graduated from my postgraduate program, an enterprising physician might have to memorize 1,700 diseases. You might be able to do that today. 55,000. I don't know about you, my brain gets challenged by trying to remember that number. And of course, in addition to the 55,000, you have to know that there are targeted therapies, more and more targeted therapies. And we're not just talking about oncology here. With infectious disease, you also want to know things like the variant or the antibiotic resistance, also critical to subcategorizing the diseases. If you don't do this, you can get what often happened as illustrated best in this absolutely famous paper from the New England Journal of Medicine, which shows what looks like an epidemic of thyroid cancer in South Korea. Simultaneously, the graph shows that mortality from thyroid cancer during this period did not budge. There's only two ways you can explain this. Either the South Koreans were brilliant at diagnosing thyroid cancer perfectly and curing every incremental instance of disease, or the disease was being overdiagnosed. It was, of course, the latter. Now, if you put these things together, it tells you one thing about our industry. And that is that the biological science has the effect of increasing the number of diseases, reducing disease incidence. If the test performance is not adequate, you will get increasing numbers of overdiagnosis, which will drive up costs and possibly harm patients. It's a trend that is both good and bad at the same time. That's okay. Artificial intelligence will save us. We'll simply throw computers at the problem. Please call me a skeptic here. I cannot count the number of early stage startups, as well as some big companies, who have used artificial intelligence to discover biomarkers, which would be perfectly suited and correlate well to a disease, only to find out in a prospective trial, it doesn't work at all. The knowledge of the underlying biology is still critically important. And that doesn't even bring into the question what regulators think. Regulators, still today, would love to find medical procedures that are underlying with well-understood science, well-documented development, manufactured with consistent quality, tested for safety and efficacy in large numbers, and not modified after release. Artificial intelligence has precisely none of these parameters. But the time is coming towards us when physicians will no longer be able to simply base their recommendations on their own experience. And even what we've now learned, that evidence-based medicine is 
most appropriate for introducing new technologies into the market, we are finding that that is also inadequate for the trends that are coming. In fact, we are already in an area of algorithm-based medicine, where because of the proliferation of some types of disease, one needs to personalize both diagnostics and treatment. And let's not forget costs, because the increasing costs in every healthcare and system in the world is not sustainable. Therefore, the diagnostic industry is confronted with a number of things. Huge amounts of complexity, increasing regulatory burden, the need to do trials on vanishingly smaller cohorts of patients, making sure the test performance is adequate to the indicated use, surveying these things afterwards and making sure they do it in a cost-effective manner. If you are a small lab with your own lab developed test or a huge manufacturer, you have all of these challenges. Now, that's not to say it's not a wonderful time to be in biology. The complexity is astounding, but it's also wonderful. In fact, I think biology today is like physics was in 1905 after Albert Einstein introduced special relativity, everything changed. And everything will continue to change in biology and change for the better. But handling this complexity in a way that is safe, consistent, efficient, and well-controlled means that regulation will get increasingly burdensome and difficult. And we have to find a way to automate that. If only there were a company to help. I'm sorry for the unabashed advertisement, but as an introductory speaker, you might expect it. I thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Tom, for a very comprehensive overview of mac macro trends in the medical diagnostics and for introducing photomics. I want to now use the opportunity to reach out to our audience, to uh, those listeners that represent manufacturers, and ask you to participate in our survey. A poll will appear now on your screens in which we want to ask you a question. In which areas do you see a need for support via automation and digitalizations? With the following answers. In helping labs document their in-house tests, that include your products in achieving CE certification for your products or a quality management system such as ISO 13485. Your answers will be absolutely anonymous and will be very appreciated by us. Thank you very much in advance. And now from macro trends, we are moving to specific IVDR challenges that manufacturers face. And I am giving over to Andreas Eckelt. Yeah, thank you for inviting me to this um, very interesting uh, hour. I'm uh, very much looking forward, not only for the uh, uh, the other three, but I was intrigued by this uh, very nice introduction from Tom Miller. I do remember that a few years ago, neither many laboratories nor SMEs were aware of what IVDR will bring to them. Though IVDD was already covering many aspects of the IVDR. IVDD and IVDR have their roots in norms such as the ISO 13485, so the accredited laborato laboratories and certified manufacturers who are familiar with 13485, 15189, and many other norms, therefore, likely have fewer problems implementing IVDR. Nevertheless, <clears throat> about one year before the initial deadline, manufacturers and lab service providers essentially divided into two groups. The, I call it ostrich group, putting their heads in the sand, <clears throat> hoping IVDR won't happen, and the other group which already collected information about how to get ready for IVDR. What has happened so far? The European Directive 9879EC, commonly called IVDD, was adopted in 1998 to be implemented in respective national laws. This implementation was driven forward in, let's say, very different ways across the EU, the resulting very heterogeneous legal situations 
within the EU and also quality problems led in 2017 to a new version. This time, a regulation which is to be implemented without diversion through national institutions, the IVDR. What is new about the IVDR is essentially that the classification of IVDs via lists was changed into classes with increasing risks according to seven rules. The list A and B products under IVDD plus a huge number of products listed as miscellaneous IVD require besides an extended documentation a notified body. This is also new is also that diagnostic related software is regulated under IVDR. What this graphic indicates is that the registration effort increases with the risk class. Class D, the highest risk class, requires in addition continuous batch verification and the involvement of a reference lab. Whereas class A non sterile, which are uh, accessories, standard laboratory systems, analyzers, require only a self declaration. Originally, the IVDR was to be launched in full on the 25th May, May of 22, and existing IVD products, as long as they aren't modified, had to be introduced into the market until then, but allowed to be sold until expiration date of the corresponding derived certificate. Early 22, an EU amendment about the risk-dependent extension of IVDR conform product introduction into the market caused some manufacturers uh, quite some headache. They already increased production and stocking of IVD products before May 22 became essentially obsolete. New deadlines allowed manufacturers to continue to offer their IVDD products according to the indicated timeline. Also, new IVDD products, miscellaneous IVD self-declared, were filed before May 22 to be able to sell them as IVD products in the corresponding time window. The chart shows the new IVDR deadlines for the introduction of commercial IVDR compliant IVD products according to the set risk classes. The reason for the delay of the IVDR is not only the corona pandemic, but also administrative and organizational problems. OIDAMED is one on the part of the EU and the national responsible organizations. What are the consequences of IVDR to manufacturers? Especially those manufacturers offering self-declared IVDD encounter a surge in requirements to be able to market equivalent IVDR products. Design needs to be thoroughly documented. The performance evaluation, especially collecting data to demonstrate clinical performance, eventually require clinical studies. And the post-market surveillance is something many companies have not even set up an infrastructure yet. As a consequence, the increase in development costs on the one side and or the lack of proper, proper documentation regarding essay design, etc., caused even larger global players to discontinue entire IVD product lines. Under IVDD, only 20% of the IVD products require a notified body. Under IVDR, this increases to 80% of all commercial IVD products. Notified bodies, just barely accredited for the new task, faced in 21 over 30,000 applications for IVDR to be certified. By now, there are 10 notified bodies for IVDR and 39 for the MDR, which is the regulation covering medical devices aside from in vitro applications. The most prominent uh, is our breast implants. Um, problems must reported, most reported with uh, notified bodies are the unpredictable approval time, significant cost, and the fact that global players already experienced with notified body involvement essentially booked the few notified bodies early enough to secure their processing of their own documents. Consequently, smaller companies were on waiting lists 
Also many, many, also many manufacturers lack the registration experience, which caused multiple iterations until acceptance, therefore prolonging the approval process even further. Post-market surveillance. The post-market surveillance requirements are embedded in the company's quality management system, namely risk management, CAPA, performance evaluation, and general safety and performance review. The performance evaluation report summarizing the results of the analytical and clinical performance studies must be made available to the notified body during the conformity assessment process. The PMS plan is part of the required technical documentation and detailed the strategy for continuously monitoring and collecting data and safety information. Also required under IVDR is to establish a so-called post-market performance follow-up, which is a subset of the PMS plan to assess, analyze, and demonstrate scientific validity, analytical and clinical performance of the device um, as, as for the intended purpose as stated by the manufacturer. An additional one for the class C and D products is the periodic safety update report. It contains in addition, conclusions of the benefit risk assessment, the number of sales, applications and patients. A significant problem for manufacturers is the so-called OAM PLM problem. Under IVDD, <clears throat> um, another issue related to the IVDR is the legal change of PLM. PLM is a company that sources products from an OEM and refers to him for IVD approval. In the OLM PLM constellation permitted under the IVDD, only the PLM and its CE mark appears on the label. The OEM wasn't recognizable. So this is an example. Um, you have an OEM supplier, I just choose Tekan, pretty prominent, I guess. And then you have um, PLMs, Roche or Everett or whatever, and they sell this under their own product name to the customers. With IVDR, both PLM and OEM must comply with the IVDR requirements for manufacturers. Some manufacturers which had not implemented the required QM system according to ISO 13485 couldn't show a valuable technical documentation for their products. The PLM said therefore to either discontinue products or look for alternative OEM suppliers with proper QM system and corresponding documentation. To fulfill the new IVDR requirements, the PLM needs access to the OEM data, making it difficult in terms of a collaboration agreement between the PLM and an OEM. Consequently, OEMs and PLMs will establish sales with established sales channels outside EU calculated the return of investment of a dedicated IVDR product line versus providing European laboratory service providers with required products and documentation for their own in-house IVD registration. A way to circumvent the OEM PLM problem is to convert a PLM into a distributor or an escrow, which serves as an intermediate between the notified body and the PLM and the OEM. Now, what do customers consider regarding IVDR? A lab service provider offering a broad selection of parameters needs to do a total cost of ownership calculation to decide whether it is worthwhile to establish an in-house IVD or to look for commercial IVDs. Many aspects such as workflow, turnaround time, hands-on time, ease of use, and other listed in the graphic needs to be considered. Although a lab needs to comply with big parts of the IVDR for in-house IVD, commonly termed homebrew or LDT, they won't need to involve a notified body nor do they require a full-blown PMS concept. A manufacturer needs to thoroughly analyze the realistic market potential of his future, future IVD products. Especially in cancer testing, the major competitor for IVDs will be in-house IVDs. Although the regula regulation keeps stating that by May 28, an in-house IVD needs to be discontinued if an equivalent commercial product is available, I personally think that on one side, there will be many ways to argue for a selective advantage over the in-house uh, IVD 
over commercial IVD or this state rule, which is called Article 55D, might be even erased. Finally, I can only recommend manufacturers as well as laboratories to collaborate in convincing healthcare systems to recognize the increased costs for both the customer and the manufacturer arising from IVD regulation. So maybe a petition to the country's health minister as a first step, potentially followed by strikes and demos would cause healthcare to recognize the health economic and clinical value of modern and well-regulated in vitro diagnostics. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. It looks like manufacturers and laboratories have a lot of challenges and a lot of requirements. They cannot feel as relaxed as you. <laughs> Thank you for this very interesting talk. And now let's listen the insights from laboratories. I am welcoming Elizabeth McIntyre, Professor Elizabeth McIntyre, with her talk about the IVDR challenges in the in-house testing. So while I'm looking for my slides, um, I'm Elizabeth McIntyre. I'm Scottish and French. I'm a diagnostic hematologist. So my medical job as a medical doctor is to um, diagnose um, lymphoid cancers. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Tom, for, for introducing the, the wide range of, uh, of lymphoid cancers that we now have to diagnose with precision. Um, I, I used to be president of the European Hematology Association, uh, but I'm here today as future president president of the Biomedical Alliance in Europe. So I'll tell you a few things about the Biomedical Alliance before giving uh, an attempt at the a consensus vision of how the users uh, or the, the in-house sector of diagnostics sees IVDR. Um, so what is the Biomedical Alliance in Europe? It's uh, an, an association that represents 36 European medical societies that represent more than 400 researchers and healthcare professionals. Now, it was intelligently set up by four medical specialties about 10 to 15 years ago because we realized that the European Commission has trouble understanding what the medical profession needs because we don't know how to speak with a clear message and with a common voice. And we really aim to, to, to accompany the whole translational value chain from basic research through translational research. And perhaps slightly less familiar for us is what, what I'll call the implementation phase of, of, of regulatory science now, or the, implement, the implementation science, which is it's all very well to publish something exciting in nature, but it, if it never gets to, to, to actually benefit the people concerned by that wonderful publication, then it's not a great service to society. Um, and, and with the creation of the European health space, one thing to bear in mind is that European medical societies are full of people who are selected in Darwinian fashion because they want to make the European health space work. So who are we? The founder societies were respiratory diabetes and cardiology, and you can see all of us here. Once you become a board member, somebody like me is no longer allowed to represent the haematologists because we will only treat transverse issues. We will not do just infection, just aging, just cancer. We're divided into committees, task forces, and working groups. There's um, continuing medical education, there's research, there's how to lim limit excess bureaucracy in randomized clinical trials. We work with experienced, excellent policy officers. But obviously in today's context, I will concentrate on what happens in the Regulatory Affairs Committee, where um, the overall committee is, is headed by somebody from the medical devices field, and I head the in vitro diagnostics task force. Now, I don't need to go through this because thankfully to my two preceding uh, speakers, you've introduced the subject very nicely. But from our point of view, when we saw the move from directives to uh, the, the IVD regulations, we realized we needed to work together on this. Now, throughout my talk, I will be mainly talking about in-house devices. Now, this is a synonymous label to laboratory developed tests, but we've, we've taken the arbitrary decision to, to, to refer to them as in-house devices, slightly to di distinguish what we're talking about in Europe, whereas the FDA tends to talk about LDTs, because if we use the same term, we think it's the same legislation or regulatory uh, landscape, which is not the case. So, um, 
between the 14 societies who asked to join the task force, three quickly became evident as, as, as being heavily involved. The European Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine, EFLM, which is mainly clinical chemists, but not only. European Society of Human Genetics, especially in the orphan uh, diagnostics field, and EHA with significant representation from the ESLO uh, subgroup, uh, which is one of our specialized working groups. And these three societies work together within the Aegis, under the Aegis of the Biomedical Alliance. Now, both Biomedical Alliance and EFLM were invited as observer stakeholders to the Medical Device Coordination Group in 2019. And that's why we set up the task force. But we were very much at the beginning seen as observers in a, in a landscape that didn't really involve the diagnostic laboratories. It went from legislative supervisory uh, by the comp national member state competent authorities and, and, and the, 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 the commission, obviously, um, through what were, was hoped to be quickly put in place, the, the reference laboratories and the, the expo med panels, which has proven a little bit more difficult than anticipated. But then it was just a pipeline that went from manufacturing to notified body to CE marking and then to post market surveillance with no space in this landscape for the labs that were doing the diagnosis. Um, and it also implied that all of diagnostics was CE marked uh, tests, which as we know is not the case, but we didn't have much data on that. So from the user point of view of the diagnostic laboratories, we were very well aware that as tests get more complex and um, rarer and possibly less interesting for the manufacturing sector, they tended to be what were LDTs or in-house um, uh, IVD tests. And they could be cellular, protein or molecular. But a lot of the genetic testing has really put this space on the market. So succinctly, our worries were that there would be loss of CE marked IVDs, especially from SMEs, and this has already been mentioned. We are conscious that this is a, there is a threat to the t translational diagnostic value chain. We are conscious that there is no way the public sector can pick up all the lost CE IVDs especially given the, 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 the expectations of the reinforced regulatory environment. We're um, conscious that we must maintain innovative diagnostics. We truly believe there is a space for self-dual re uh, re respect between the diagnostic academic community, community and the manufacturing community, but this is being severely called into or shaken up because of IVDR. And as has already been uh, mentioned, we're significantly concerned by the risk of monopolies from Article 5.5D that um, mentions equivalence but has no idea how to define it. And uh, we do not understand why um, the, 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 our perception of this article is very much protecting industry against the absolutely undeniable requirement to maintain an academic uh, um, diagnostic sector. So we got together to look at what was the split between CE marked tests. Now, we know that almost all the results that patients get are CE IVD marked. I'm not talking here about the number of test results given out. I'm talking about the category of tests. And the bottom line was that half of the tests used in the 25 laboratories who answered our, um, sorry, by the 203 laboratories that answered our questionnaire in 25 of the 27 EU member states, half of them were CE IVDs, half of them, a quarter were in-house IVDs here in red, and a quarter were the gray zone in between of RUOs and modified CEIVD usage. But this varied significantly uh, between disciplines with, uh, with a lot of the, the, the IVDs being in genetics, whether it be um, germline defects or oncogenetics, uh, and also in, 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 um, in pharmacology. This has been published, if any of you want to see the details. And importantly, Olga Tretchenko from the um, IVDR section in DG Sante working on the IVD legislation. So uh, a commission 
employee and responsible person accepted to sign this paper with us, which doesn't happen every day. And the main importance to that is that she okayed this map where we'd shown that because of communication and because of constructive support and multi-stakeholder communication, uh, we now um, refer to a map that has put the health institutions alongside the manufacturers associated to technology transfer in this view or this vision of the IVDR European regulatory framework. And I think that's bringing us towards envisaging rare diagnostic networks because um, it is illusory to think that the notified bodies can manage this all on their own. So to conclude, I'm of an optimistic nature, but I think that IVDR compliance is both a threat and an opportunity for Europe. But multi-stakeholder communication will determine the balance between threat and opportunity. I think there's a very clear need for guidance in the form of, of European multilingual accessible templates. But I think these will pr be provided in different ways for CE testing and for in-house IVD testing. I think that the competitivity of European translational implementation and regulatory research in medical devices is at stake. But now is the time to get it right. That's why at Biomed Alliance, we're um, keen to, to stay involved in this. We encourage reinforcement of implementation and regulatory science training for medical specialists via and with European medical societies. And on that note, I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor McIntyre, for this very interesting talk. I guess it now becomes obvious that in-house testing is not a solely problem of laboratories, but it also impacts manufacturers. And to understand how, uh, to which extent it impacts manufacturers, we at Potomics, we also decided to perform a survey that uh, was uh, accomplished in one of our previous webinars where more than 150 laboratories were asked to provide a list of most important man manufacturers whose products they are using in the setting of the in-house test and whose products they would like to see on our regulatory platform as a support for their LDT documentation. And we were very surprised to get the list of more than 200 companies, which illustrates how many different products are still used in the setting of the in-house test and how much support those laboratories need in setting up a compliant testing and uh, continuously testing in a compliant way. And now um, I'm actually glad to tell you that we reached out to those manufacturers on the list and most of them are attending our webinar today, which is very exciting. And we also invited one manufacturer, our partner and our early adopter to give a talk at this webinar and to share their experience. I'm talking about Medix Biochemica and I want to invite Simone Marx now to the stage to tell us about experience of Medix, um, about how customers of Medix are challenged by IVDR and what they need to be supported. Okay, then thank you, Elena. And thanks uh, for inviting us. So we would like to give you a short uh, view on IVDR impact that we see on our Medix customers and also um, why we are here in this um, program as an early adopter. Let me quickly tell you a little bit about us. Um, so um, we are uh, initially a spin-off from university. My name is Simone Marx. I'm director quality, regulatory affairs and business strategy in my polls. We have been founded as a spin-off of university and we are working on shaping and customization polymerases. We are located in Germany, Constance, as I mentioned. Now we are a part of the bigger group of the Medix Biochemica, who is all over the world. And we as a group, we're really focusing on offering customized and off-the-shelf products for IVD manufacturers. So for labs and also other IVD manufacturers, we call it raw material or components. 
Let's have a very quick look in our portfolio. So here in Constance, we are the hub um, for molecular diagnostic, but we also offer other areas, for example, like biospecimen, that is in US from LiBio, some of them, from some of you uh, may know this then. Whatever we do, quality is very, very important here. And I think we saw this with Tom that if a test is not performing well, then there is a lot of uh, uh, that is not so good for the patient and the healthcare at all. And, and therefore, that is already something that brings us to the first impact. Um, we see a lot of more uh, requirements with regards to regulatory um, support and quality than we have seen in the past. So if we look into a concrete uh, in-house IVD development project, we have seen that there is a lot of requirements. And if we look into it a little bit more concrete, then it means there is documentation that needs to be created. There is much more validation. And um, there's a lot of, let me say, performance testing and also safety testing, all that is around to have a good and very well performing assay. And that brings our customers to a wish list that goes for labs, but also, of course, this goes for IVD developers as an IVD manufacturer. In some cases, we see that there is very less knowledge, especially in smaller labs when it comes to regulatory requirements. So sometimes they just ask us, hey, can you tell us to us? We are not a consultant. We are a manufacturer of raw material, but we see that we people are asking us to explain them what they need to take care of. First, they really don't know exactly what they have to do. And there is a lot of uncertainty. They also ask us, hey, can you just share all your technical documentation? Of course, we cannot. But what we can share is um, doc documentation that would help the customers to apply. And then finally, um, they also ask us for um, performance evaluation plans and performance evaluation reports to write this and to support them with this. So what does it mean? Uh, what is one of the requirements and how, uh, what tools can we offer here? It's not enough to have a good product anymore. In the past, they have asked for what is the performance and what is the functionality of your product. That is not enough anymore. Now they are more and more asking for more and more quality, more and more regulatory support, and they are asking for a sustainable supplier. Because we all know, once you have validated a component in an IVD, it's not easy to change it. So you want to have a trust-able partner. And if we directly look into IVD in-house, in-house IVD, we are not talking only about a device. We are not talking about one region that is in a component. In-house IVD is more a procedure where the lab is looking into the validation of the full process. And that is then a complexity that shows us that more and more components need to come and to go together. So how can we support this process of the in-house EVD development? And if I talk about IVD development, it means I talk about replacing components in existing IVD or develop new IVD. Of course, as I mentioned before, you have to convince them about your quality. We have the ISO certification. We are doing a lot of things here to really show that our general laboratory use or also our research use only products is, has a high quality. We give a lot of technical support. That is good. That is what we like. That is what we really like to do. But now it's also, of course, then uh, combined with advice on regulatory requirements. So we more and more really assist the labs, our laboratory customers, to make sure that our component fits together with the other components. In some cases, this needs an adaptation and further development of the component. What is again good? Because if you replace something that is maybe not 100% fit, and then this is our core business to adapt and to shape it, to really make it 
integrated in the process of the labs. Finally, when everything is done, we have to have supply agreements, as you know, or quality assurance agreements. All this costs a lot of time on both sides, for the labs and also for us as supplier. Um, but what we all want to do is we want to focus on making the tests and the assays better to come to better patient care. So we ask ourselves, and thank you, Tom, for the topic with the automation, how can we make it faster? How can we have our portfolio and what would be our wish list? And we think it's the same wish list like the in-house IVD developers. What would be the wish list to simplify and accelerate the process? What if there is a trusted partner that gives you approved quality? When you order from this platform, you know the quality is approved. What if you have product information that is digitalized, where you can search in, where you can really easy compare components of different um, suppliers? What if this is already then somehow uh, linked with automated regulatory support? Already these two points would make it more easy and to integrate components into the full procedure. It would be very much simplifying it and it would give more time for technical adjustments or even improvements. Finally, if we do not have to have a contract with each customer, what if there is an automated commercial process that would help? And that is the reason why we are taking part here as early adapter in this um, Platomics offer. We think that, for example, the Plato X IVD assistant would help both supplier and labs to speed up this process. A quick summary. We are Medix Biochemica is supplying raw material and components for IVD. We see a lot more questions with regards to quality, regulatory requirements, a lot more time that is spent on formal things and not on making things better. And finally, we believe that with automated processes and especially also digitalization, we could speed up the process, we can match, make things much more easier. Thank you for your time. This is the end for my speech. Thank you, Simone, for a very insightful talk. And now we are moving to the last part of our webinar in which I will present you the IVD Ready program that Platomics launched in May this year. And this is basically a gateway that um, guides laboratories in a stepwise process to the IVDR compliance by May 2024. So it's a free one year program that consists of 12 webinars wizards that uh, guide and automate regulatory data creation and also software platforms such as IVD Assistant that was just mentioned by Simone and is already available. I will talk about this in a second. And electronic quality management system as well as the software for CE certification that are coming soon. So in the IVD Ready program, we are guiding laboratories step-by-step, step, focusing on every topic uh, and every different document for the uh, LDT Tech Talk in a series of webinars. And we already organized successful two successful webinars. And I want to now use this opportunity to invite you to the next webinar that will take place on Tuesday, on July 25th. And in this webinar, which is called Give it a Purpose, we will focus on the generation on the, we will give guidance on how to write intended purpose. And we will demonstrate a new wizard that allows to create an intended purpose with just few clicks. I also want to uh, inform you that in the next webinar, we are applying a new technology in uh, live of, of a live translation. So this webinar will be possible to watch live in three different languages, English, German, and French. So register for the next webinar. But what is uh, more important in the IVG Ready for Manufacturers is actually the biggest milestone, which we call Open the Gates, and we, which will take place on uh, September 30. 
And exactly on that day at this event, the manufacturers will come into play. And how exactly this will happen, I will show you on the next slide. But before, I want to give you some background information about the IVD assistant for laboratories, which was launched uh, one and a half years ago and was widely accepted by more than 300 laboratories in the European Union. And we even have uh, organized a webinar where some of our customers shared their positive experience of using IVD assistant for their LDT documentation. Unfortunately, it's only available in German, but we will share the link in the chat. And I want to emphasize that this tool for IVD compliant documentation was accepted so well by the laboratories because they are now uh, obliged to document their LDTs. And in this process, they are re-evaluating their workflows and in-house tests, which is on one side um, puts the IVD market at risk. While the market, the IVD market is still far away from being saturated with CE certified products, laboratories are unable in many cases to continue compliant testing, especially if they are not supported by manufacturers. On another hand, it opens a window of opportunity for manufacturers, which can enable laboratories uh, to perform compliant in-house testing. For seeing this window of opportunity, we started developing uh, IVD assistant for manufacturers, a module for manufacturers. And I'm very thrilled to announce today that the official release of the uh, module for manufacturers is planned for August 21. This will mean that manufacturers will be able to register on the platform and bring their products along with the regulatory data that can support their laboratories and they can participate in Open the Gates event. On that day, we will connect module for laboratories and module for manufacturers. And from this day on, laboratories will be able to access products that they are using for their in-house tests on our platform. And they will be able to integrate in an automated way regulatory data into their LDT tech doc. This connection between the two modules can be also used in both ways. Uh, we are planning to develop um, additional functionalities to collect post-market surveillance data on those products that are used by the laboratories. It can be also used for communication between different stakeholders, for providing consultancy services and for other um, important functions as well. Right now, Plato X IVD Assistant already contains plenty of different templates for IVDR documentation. It also contains a regulatory knowledge base a wizard for automated content creation and the document editor and standards that database. And now we are bringing into this system key elements, a workflow studio for laboratories and product database that will be filled up by uh, product information uh, by manufacturers. To give you a look and feel idea, of the IVD assistant, I want to now quickly demonstrate you several screens from soon to be released new modules. So at the step of the product registration, uh, several blocks of information uh, that some of them are mandatory, some of them are optional, can be provided for different products. As you can see on the screen, there is a general information tab. There is a GSPR wizard that I will talk about later detailed information that usually contains information that can be found in the instruction for use. The documents can be attached or linked to our platform. And once the product is published, it will appear in the product database and can be accessed by the laboratories and can be integrated in, the, in their LDT documentation. The GSPR wizard is one of the automation examples on our platform. As you know, general safety and performance requirements is a long list of um, almost 200 questions that have to be reviewed uh, when you document a CE product or an in-house test. And uh, we in Potomix 
broke down this complex regulatory text in very simple yes no questions that everyone can understand and everyone can answer as those that you see on your screen and we also pre-filtered them based on the type of the product that you are registering on our platform so the list is now much shorter and is very understandable and very simple we also built in logical rules into these wizards that ensure automatic uh, automated content generation for the regulatory documentation based on the answers provided in the wizard. So how it looks on the side of the laboratories, how exactly this information will be integrated into the LTT documentation. Uh, now I'm showing you the screen from the laboratory portal and laboratories that are attending our webinar will definitely, and our using AVD systems, will definitely notice a new, more intuitive design that we will present release next week. And you can see that we already planned a release of the workflow studio. It will be released uh, in September. And this is exactly this connection gateway between laboratories and manufacturers. Through the workflow studio, laboratories will be able to document the sequence of steps of their workflows and they will be able to search products for each step and add them into their documentation. By adding a product into the workflow, the whole regulatory data associated with this product will be migrated in respective parts of the LDT documentation. This screen demonstrates a document editor on our platform, and we are looking right now at the general safety and performance requirements checklist for an in-house test. And here we have uh, integrated data such as applicability, justification for a GSPR requirement, and even documents, if they were provided by the manufacturer, can be automatically integrated in such reports. There are also other types of data that are not shown here on the screen that will automatically will be automatically migrated from the product into the LDT documentation. Another benefit that IVD assistant will bring to manufacturers is the um, ability to have a full overview on what is happening with your products, which laboratories are using your products, in which in-house tests exactly they are applying these products, on which steps of these workflows and with, with which other components they are combining your products. So all this business intelligence will be available, not in September, but soon on the platform as well to allow you quick reaction on all possible issues or requests from your customers. And now to summarize benefits, I still have a few minutes left. Uh, I want to once again emphasize that IVD Ready program and IVD Assistant platform will help you to ensure business continuity by supporting labs customers under IVDR. And it will also help you to win new customers because your products can be found by constantly growing community of laboratories on our platform in the product database. And my last slide shows you the overview of our roadmap and what else we are planning to develop. Um, all colorful hexagons are uh, depicting the already existing functionalities and modules on our platform. And we are, uh, will be focusing in the next month on the developing post-market surveillance module for manufacturers, as well as software for CE certification documentation. And for laboratories, we will be developing an electronic quality management system, such as ISO 15189. We also want to bring to the platform our partner consultants and uh, offer functionalities through which they can provide ser uh, consultancy services to both laboratories and manufacturers on our platform. So now if you want to participate in the gate opening event, you can submit a request to access a video assistant or a request for a follow-up meeting using the link that will be now added to the chat, or you can scan a QR code uh, on the screen and we will contact you very soon with more details. 
those of you who already ticked off the checkbox for pre-registration for IVD assistant, you don't, don't need to do anything because we already have your data and we will contact you soon. Having this said, um, I think we are running out of time. I unfortunately have to finish this webinar. I want to thank once again all our uh, invited speakers. And I also want to say, thank uh, audience and those manufacturers that participated in our survey. The video of this webinar will be available on our webpage at the beginning of the next week. Stay tuned with Plotomics, participate in our next webinars. And with this, I wish you a nice rest of the day and all the best. Thank you very much.